what happens when a, a long, slender, um, the axial dimension being the greater one on these type of members, um, and we're, we're loading it in some kind of torsion or twist. And we found out the, uh, the other day that the maximum shear stress then will be, of course, a function of the torsional load. This is uh, the, the applied load just like the uh, axial force was before. Uh, also a function of C over J. Remember what those two things are? What C stand for? And it's, it's true now, and it's going to be true uh, for the rest of the term that we use this C in this way. So it's very useful that you recognize it. The maximum radius. It's the maximum rate. Well, uh, right now it's radius. But we'll be looking at non-circular cross-sections in a little bit. And so it could be the, uh, the maximum distance. Uh, with, for example, we could look at, at uh, T-beams. And we're going to find what's called the neutral axis. And then C is going to be the greatest distance from that, which could be either up to that edge or down to that edge, depending upon uh, the, the uh, geometry of the cross-section and where this neutral axis falls. Uh, but it does mean the maximum distance from some neutral spot. And for circular things, of course, a neutral spot right at the center makes some good sense. So it is the radius for these circular cross-sections. We're not actually going to do it but if you want to just read through the, one of the section, chapter sections we're skipping, it uh, discusses, I believe, non-circular torsional, uh, loads on non-circular uh, members, also on uh, uh, what are called thin wall members, which is uh, a, uh, any, any very, very thin walled uh, tube of some kind. So that will stand for the maximum distance for the next couple weeks for lots of the things we look through, whether they're circular or not. And remember what the J is? Oh, no, why not? J. I mean, if nothing else, go by the first letter and see what it stands for, because that always works. <laughs> Phil, you remember? My favorite student comes to the rescue. That's the polar moment of inertia. It's uh, just like our regular moment of inertia that we had. Um, we looked at a lot in statics last term, only for circular uh, shapes, circular cross sections in this case. The uh, the intermediate equivalent of that, of course, this is just the maximum load, but that's where most of the concern is. Uh, we can also look at some intermediate radius, some radius where uh, we're inside the piece, but that's, that's not quite the concern, uh, certainly not on solid pieces, because the maximum stress is at the outer surface. Uh, but it could be if we have a tubular cross-section, uh, you could be worried about the stress at the inside where maybe there's cladding or adhesive or something, something similar to that. All right, so we're going to add to this a little bit now as we do just what we did in uh, our axial loading where first we looked at the the loading and its direct effects in terms of the stress induced in the material. Then we looked at the deformation under those loads, which is really the step we took beyond what we could have done in statics. We could have done the internal stresses in statics and, and not uh, gotten out of the, uh, the general purview of that uh, subject. But, um, adding the, the actual deformation of the pieces. And we're going to do that now, look at the deformation of 
some piece when loaded by some torsional load, as would happen in a drive shaft. So if we put a couple reference lines down here, so imagine down the parallel to the axis, uh, but inscribed on the outside, maybe um, not a real inscription, but just for a reference point of view, and then one from there down to the radius, and see what happens to that under this torsional load. As applied like that, that we expect that this uh, front face here would turn in some measure greatly exaggerated there and that the, the line inscribed on the outside would also have some angle to it. So again, the deformation caused by the loading, greatly exaggerated here just so we can see it, but it would look something like that. So let's put a little bit uh, to this. Let's imagine this is of some length dx. We have uh, an angle here that we have already investigated. That happens to be, of course, the shear strain. Remember, that's the deviation from an original angle of 90 degrees. And if you want to look at it from some side, that, that maybe if I draw it on edge, this, this reference line that was like that and now conforms <coughs> to that because of the torsional load, this is indeed the strain because we can look at this angle here as the original 90 degree angle that's now been deformed and the deformation of that 90 degree angle is our strain. So we've seen that before, I don't remember if we've seen it in exactly this way. And then this angle on the end here we'll call that some amount of deformation d d phi. And then this arc length subtended right there, if that's the, the right word, is the shear strain times that uh, distance over which it acts. That's the that's the arc length from the uh, axial direction and from the end on direction then of course we've got um, uh, the equivalent arc, arc length C, D, Fui there. Or the shear strain is some geometric constant of the um, geometry of the cross-section over d phi dx and then uh, we're almost ready to uh, to integrate that. Remember that we've got this this material constant we call the modulus of rigidity which is the normal stress over the shear stress. So we can put that in and we get then combining those two we get that the maximum shear stress is equal to Two, uh, two constants, the product of two constants independent of the load times however much angle, <coughs> dis angular distortion we get per unit length of material. But that maximum shear stress we already know to be this. So now we can combine 
the angular deformation with the torsional uh, formula, the loading itself, and now we can get uh, uh, angular deformation as a function of the load and other geometric properties. So I think that that baby there looks like it's ready to integrate. So move the dx over, integrate, everything's a constant. Those two things are constant. And everything else is also a constant. And so uh, uh, where dx, of course, we're integrating over the whole length of the thing. However long this piece is. And we get then that the total angular deformation is... Let's see, the, uh, the C's cancel on either side. We get T, this integrates just to L. And G comes down at the bottom. We get that the total angular deformation is a function of, of course, the load. The greater the twist, the greater the angle, your angular deformation is going to be. Also, the length of the piece. Uh, that makes pretty good sense. If you've got a real short piece and you're loading it, it's not going to twist as much. When you've got a much longer piece, it's just going to twist more. There's more flexibility in those. You can, you can uh, go home and test that with just a, a kind of a slender piece of wood. You can just grab it on the ends and twist it, grab it at different places. Uh, G, of course, being a material constant. Uh, that makes sense too. Their materials, uh, different materials, are going to twist different amounts. Steel is much different than rubber. And then, of course, J, uh, the cross-sectional uh, polar moment of inertia. So, as simple as that, I believe. Just so you know where we are to anchor a little bit. That's equation 515 in the book. I'm not sure how handy if both additions that we're using here, well, including the international edition, but it's around there somewhere, just so you know where we are. So that's pretty easy to use. So we'll run a little test, test problem with it. So imagine some long, slender piece, maybe a drive shaft, maybe an axle or a spindle of some kind. Fifty-four inches in length, one point five inches in diameter, with a load of two hundred and fifty foot pounds. And a modulus of rigidity of 11.5 times 10 to the third KSI. So we've got, what's that? That's, a, a, that's about four and a half feet long and a, about an inch and a half in diameter. So uh, well, probably the kind of thing you might have in your trunk that you go take into the bar fight with you. Because they're going to grab the pool cues, right Travis? You've got this, so you're more well prepared. So we can figure out then the, the amount of twist in the end. Now, <clears throat> we'll check the units as we go along to see what happens here. 250 foot-pounds. Now, everything else is in inches, so probably that needs to be converted, converted to feet. Uh, sorry, inches, times the length of the piece makes sense. The longer the piece, the greater the angular deformation. G, 11.5 times 10 to the third, and this is 
kilopounds per square inch. And then J, I think I have J, I don't need you to calculate it. You can uh, confirm 0 0.497 inches to the fourth. So we've got uh, pounds and pounds are going to cancel. Uh, once you take care of the individual units, you get length squared. That's on the bottom, that came as length to the fourth. That cancels that length to the fourth. So this is unitless, meaning then the, the measure of these angles are, of course, radians. So you can look at that real quick, see what we got, the uh, kind of thing we're talking about, and how much angle. Yeah, if you don't convert this feet to inches, then it's not going to combine with the other inches to cancel out. And you've got to change either easy. the kip, kips to pounds or the pounds to kips one way or the other. That might be easy to forget. Might be easy to forget? Is that what you said? Yeah. No, not this group. Some other, maybe at MIT or something. <laughs> Those students forget this stuff, but not you guys. No, you, you guys know to watch your units. hardest part sometimes they, yeah it's the hardest I mean this isn't difficult you're right it's when you get the numbers in and we're working with some very very big numbers and very very small numbers that's as hard as it is to do any of the stuff we're doing here and don't forget we can also find the maximum shear stress in the problem By uh, calculating that, remember I gave you that little that little bonus piece the other day. Once I uh, corrected it from the board, um, so that's pretty easy to figure out too. And that would have units of psi. So that uh, that's not going to take too much to work with that. Remember, torsion has the same units as moment or torque, foot pounds, uh, something like that. So that's going to have PSI or KSI as the units if that's more appropriate. All right, so you run the numbers. Anybody got them yet? Joey, looking at something on your screen. No? Don't want to share it with us? We got 28.3. Radians? Yeah. Let's see, yeah. There's about <clears throat> six radians in one twist, so that's that's what that's about four full twists around. I don't think you can even do that with one of those string cheese things. Get that to go full four twists. So I want to check your units here. Make sure I've got everything was right, yeah? All things to match. Somebody else got something a little different? Sounds like you may have missed the uh, a, a unit uh, a factor of thousand. Phil? Zero point zero two eight three. Okay, that's what I have. So you have the two eight three, Travis. Just sounds like you uh, you missed a little bit. Now that turns out to be about one point six degrees, which is more than enough for there to be the possibility of trouble with gears meshing uh, at either end of these, if that's the, the purpose of this as, a, as some kind of drivetrain. And the tau max should get something like 4.5 KSI. All right, so not too difficult to uh, put those things together, but uh, 
but uh, we can certainly come up with problems that get a little bit more difficult since the equations themselves aren't terribly so, as we said, and as Travis proved so kindly for us, we can get to be down to just a, a problem of watching the units. In fact, uh, this can be very good if you think about it um, as a method, oh no, I don't have it on the board. This can be very useful as a tool to actually measure what G is in a material, as the, 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 the actual testing method for determining the modulus of rigidity. Apply load on a, a piece of known geometry, measure its deflection, and calculate G from that, which is not, uh, not unlike what we did when we found E. Apply a load, measure the deformation, and then get E from that. It's just a little bit different in the actual application of it. All right, another quick one for you. So now we have some tubular piece with a load. Uh, actually, determine the maximum torque allowable for a, an angle of twist of no more than two degrees. J is for a tubular cross section. And you know which radius is C1 and C2 because that couldn't be a negative number.
Again, watch your units. We have millimeters and they're going to be to the fourth power. So that gets to be a pretty big, small number. A couple students are volunteering to fall for the small trap in this problem. But not everybody. stepped over it. He saw what looked ahead and be quicksand. No, you're doing fine so far. I keep going. so you don't come back to them later and not notice that they're on. Phil? What's next up? Well, you don't have the same answer as he does. Now remember this two degrees cannot go in the equation like that. It must be radians. So I think most of you caught it by now. Some started without catching it, but most of you caught it by now. 34.9. Degrees is a unit that doesn't just disappear like radians conveniently does. It'll stay in there if you have it in there. Okay, reconsidered. You have a loose knot on the keyboard, keypad. All right, 
Okay, I think most everybody's getting it now. Something like 1.83 kilonewton meters. Units should work out. Be careful on these. What the actual value for that? Uh, I don't know if I have it separate. Yeah, I do 1.02 times 10 to the minus 6. And that's meters, meters to the fourth. Remember, that's, these are diameters, and these are radii. I don't, why they do that, why they can't put diameters in here and then pull whatever constants left over out to the one half, I'm not real sure, but it's just one of those things we like to do to students. All right, everybody catch all the little pieces in and get something like that? Not quite yet, David? Mm -hmm. I think something went wrong in calculating J. You're not getting that? No. Don't forget, these are diameters you were given. These oh, are radiuses, no radii, radii in the equation. Another way to catch that. Be very convenient if this was based on radius, I mean diameter, and the, the one half to the fourth was just pulled out and added to that, but that's that's too nice for us to do. We're not going to do that kind of thing for students. All right, so let's let's uh, step it up a little bit. Imagine we have a long gear shaft with a couple points at which power is. Taken off or added by uh, maybe some gears at certain points. And we've got uh, a couple things going on. So we've got a, a, an applied torque at that one, an opposite direction on the other two. So maybe the center one's a drive gear, and then the uh, other two are, are power takeoffs. So, and then of course the ends in uh, some kind of bearing just to stabilize it, of course. It's all one solid shaft, 30 millimeters in diameter. And let's see, what other little pieces do we have? Okay, let's label the different points. A, B, C, D, and E. Because there's different lengths at each one, between each one. So the, the loads are, the applied is 450 newton meters. Take off at B275. And at C one seventy five. And the distances between these, let's see, B to C is five hundred millimeters. And C to D is 400. Now the trouble here is, well not the trouble, but the, the obvious uh, uh, extra complication we didn't have before 
is between B and C, there's going to be a bit of angular deflection, deformation, and between C and D, there is as well. And I want to find the maximum deflection and the total deflection. They may, may be different. Most likely they are. Um, because uh, B to C is going to twist one way, C to D is going to twist the other. So one or the other of those could be the maximum deflection, but the two together, uh, since they'll be in opposite directions, would give a different angular deflection. So let's find the maximum shear stress and the total angular deflection. Uh, you also need Two other little pieces. G is 80 megapascals, and the extra dimensions on either end to the bearings, uh, 120 millimeters on each end. sort of like this on Monday. So for any loaded section, you need to look at what the maximum shear stress is in that section. Uh, I'll give you J so you don't have to do that. Actually, you can skip it, remember, if you use that little piece we have there. And then you don't even have to leave the radius, you can use just the, the diameter is given. our usual angular deformation you will need J for that so I'll go ahead and give it to you so you don't have to fuss with that solid polar moment of inertia in terms of diameter. So make it a little easier for you. 79.520. So there it is in millimeters, so you don't have to do that. the internal torsion in the shaft between A and B.
so that you can investigate which one is the maximum shear stress and which one and how much angular deformation there is in each section so that you can add up the total deflection end to end. So what's the torsional load A in the material A to B, the internal torsional load? What, Phil? You had an answer earlier. Yeah. You're backing off? Maybe. Yeah, there is no load. Remember, uh, for any of the pieces we've looked at, it's always based on equal and opposite of either end. For the section AB, there's no torsion here. It's just held by a stabilizing bearing. We assume it's a high quality one from Ace Hardware again. Uh, so in A and B, from in the section A to B, there is no torsional load, meaning there won't be any shear stress and there won't be any angular deflection in that section. So it's only B to C and C to D that are loaded because D to E is also not loaded. There's no torsion in the sections uh, D to E for the same reason. Sense, Joe? What's the I? The, the I just has to do with the fact there's going to be a couple sections you're going to have to figure out the angular deflection for each of the sections because each of the sections has their own internal load and their own length. Uh, B to C is 500, C to D is 400 millimeters. So that's just an a, a index, a summation index. forget as you calculate these that the angular deformation in the two sections are going to be in opposite directions. So you can uh, assign one as negative or just pay attention to the to what the difference is but uh, the direction of the angular deflection is also important in the end, so you might do well to assign one direction as negative, one as positive. into it. Uh, your piece would be way beyond that. It'd be more like the rubber bands on the wind-up airplanes. But at least you recognize something wasn't quite right. I'm glad you didn't put in a number like that. So check where the places are that things can go wrong. This is millimeters. This is meters. These are millimeters. 
this is megapascals. These are just straight newtons. So there's there's the places things can go wrong. So that's all the internal load is in that one. And for C to D, we can do the same thing out the opposite end. So we've got the torsional load of each. We can double check then what the maximum shear stress is. And that's D cubed because uh, that came from a simplification of C over J and both of them had radius terms in them. Travis, you have this one? The maximum shear stress? 33.1. Yeah, something a little, maybe a little bit around up. Remember, uh, the precision of these numbers isn't terribly important.
either one of these torsions you can sign as negative. And then when you add them together, they'll cancel. But make sure you understand which is the uh, direction, total deflection. Got something on that, Travis? Same as Chris? Hundred thousand radians, yeah. something like that. So using the, the yeah, I don't know if we can cover that with a factor of safety. All right, then for each of these. And I did give you G. Yep. So you have to watch out for your units. units, it should be unitless because it's radians. So, Phil, you have this for DC? I don't think it's right. Is it 600,000 radians? No. Okay, then is it less than that? Yeah. That's, that's what's called the Travis limit. Chris, what do you have for, for this first section, B to C? Radians? Does it really? Yeah, it's on all the time. I think it was eight. Well, let's make sure I gave you all the right numbers. Newton meters, newton meters, millimeters. Okay, oh, now I can't read that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Now I now will get that. Good, that's the easiest one to fix. Sorry about that. Let's see. So that's what? 10 to the 9th right here. 
which is what we need, right? We need a tree on the bottom. Okay. Yeah, see what happens when you don't fix the little mistakes and you leave them and then find them a year later? It's still, is, you know, when you take this a year from now, then it's that same mistake will be there. So that comes out to be a little better, I hope. Uh, that comes out to be a 0.0216 radians. One, two, three. Yeah. 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 Okay. And in the opposite direction, 0 0.0110. So, um, so this one is, uh, maybe if we call uh, that the positive direction, so that would make this first one negative. And then they add together to give a deflection. They cancel each other a little bit. We still get some in the negative direction, so we know that end to end there's going to be a little bit of twist uh, in the direction of the middle uh, torque. Oh, 106 radians or about minus uh, six-tenths of a degree. All right, we agree on most of those numbers. Joey, you got those now too? Now we got little pieces fixed. Okay. Not difficult equations to use. The setups aren't all that difficult, but we're watching the units, especially if I uh, mislead you with the wrong units from the start. What you don't know is I'm obligated to do that because the equations are so simple, I have to screw you up in other ways. We talk about that at the professor meetings all the time. Okay, uh, the next little part we need is the, well, very same type thing we did is we were looking at the axial loadings. After we looked at the loads themselves and the stresses they induce, then we looked at the deformations they cause, then we uh, applied what we've learned there to statically indeterminate loading. Meaning just what? What's a, a statically indeterminate problem? <clears throat> Using just the equations of statics, it's unsolvable because there are too many unknowns. Um, for example, imagine we've got a uh, some kind of uh, uh, axial member between two rigid supports. So, how do you draw that? Might be easier just to put it on and especially since what we have on this one is that it's uh, not a constant cross-section. From one end to midway down, it's bored out. So we have a solid piece for half of it, and then a tubular piece for half of it. And right down the middle is a torsional load of 90 foot-pounds.
So whichever one of the drawings you prefer. sees the middle. And what other pieces can I give you here? We need, uh, I don't have the radii, but I have the uh, polar moments of inertia for you. Seven point six times ten to the minus three. Inches. And forty two point six times ten to the minus three. Now the re or the, the the way we get out of the static indeterminacy of this is the fact that because it's mounted at two ends, two rigid ends, then there's no overall total deflection. Using that, we'll be able then to come up with another equation. Well, in fact, essentially that is the other equation, and we can then solve the problem, find the reactions at the walls. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm just the fourth. Okay, our, uh, our statics only tells us that the reactions are nothing more than equal to the total load. But we don't know how much of the load is at each uh, each one of the supports. So we need then to add to it the, the deflection part that the deflection between A and C must be equal and opposite to that between C and D. So the total deflection end to end is zero because of the two rigid supports. So that then allows us to determine just how much is at each one of the ends. Material is. Remember what happened last time with the oh, axial loading? The material constant, this G, in that case it was E, canceled out. But the solution is the same no matter what this material is. Which I think is always very interesting. And the lengths happen to be equal, which is convenient. Well, it just makes it a little easier. When you, when you set this up, those two will cancel. cancels, we get just the inverse ratio of the two polar moments of inertia. Wouldn't, wouldn't be that simple, except the lengths are the same. Could, could have been, too, that they were different materials. That would certainly have been a possibility. But given that, you can now solve that. Now we're down to uh, just these two equations as, 
as enough to solve it. So it's a matter of fairly simple mathematics now. same direction. You get 51.7 foot pounds. Now it's just a, a simple ratio of the two and 38.3. This material is different than that material, then then the G's wouldn't cancel. But the reality is, is probably that I mean you would still treat something as uh, having uh, same density throughout. I mean that's realistic. Oh, density doesn't come into it. Or not? Um, however, you calculate rigidity mm -hmm. throughout the length of any given material. I mean, with the safety factor, it's enough to ignore. Uh, well, no, it depends on what the two materials are. Um, if this was uh, brass and this was rubber or something, that'd be very, very different. But it's not uh, too big a deal. It would just be in here. But you'd have GAC here and GCD, not CD, uh, CB, sorry, CB there. Okay. Again, we have to realize what the uh, deformation does for us in giving us the other equation. All right. Uh, questions on this one for clear? I'm just going to set up. We don't really have a lot of time, but I'll set up another one for us that uh, just step things things up a little bit in terms of the static indeterminacy of the problems. So imagine we have a uh, drive shaft that looks something like this. The cylinder, the, the hollowed out section is six tenths of a meter. Oops, not quite to scale. Let's clean it up a little bit. And then the solid part of the big shaft is two tenths of a meter. And then four tenths of a meter for the other part. Thirty millimeter OD on the end, twice that for the big section, and then the inside 
part 44 millimeter ID inside diameter. Seven megapascals, and now we want to find the deflection of that free end, which uh, which we'll call A. Find the angular deflection of the end. minutes or so, so uh, obviously that's the angular deflection of the intermediate pieces. Check, see if you can get it. But I have actually 2.3 degrees as the total deflection of that end, even with uh, each of those. Oh, sorry, double check here. These loads are not in opposite directions, they're in the same direction. for Monday, and then we'll do another statically indeterminate problem and uh, look at stress concentrations and drive shafts.